Hi, it's a pleasure for me to actually introduce Dr. Kumagai. This is the last MedEd Grand Rounds for the season. Uh, please everyone fill out your um, evaluation forms at the end and we will have a lunch afterwards in the room so we encourage you to stay to be able to have a more informal conversation. Um, so Dr. Kumagai received his BA in Comparative Literature from UC Berkeley and his MD from UCLA School of Medicine. He did his residency in internal medicine at Harbor UCLA and his fellowship in postdoc studies in endocrinology at UCLA. He joined the faculty of the University of Michigan Medical School in 1996. He's professor of internal medicine and medical education at the University of Michigan. He's an endocrinologist. His clinical interests are in intensive management of type 1 diabetes and insulin-induced hypoglycemia, and he has been uh, funded by the NIH, the uh, NIDDK, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation also. Um, he's a reviewer for numerous journals, including the Annals, Academic Medicine, Medical Teacher, and Advances in Health Sciences Education. Since 2003, at the University of Michigan Medical School, he's been the director of the Family-Centered Experience Program and Longitudinal Case Studies, which are two small group-based courses in the first two years of medical school. He also directs the second-year endocrinology sequence and is active in curriculum design and administration. He's also the recipient of numerous teaching awards, including the AAMC Pfizer Award for Humanism in Medical Education, the Leonard Toe Award for Humanism in Medicine, the Kaiser Permanente Award for Excellence in Basic Science Teaching, and the Provost Innovative Teaching Prize from the University of Michigan. He also has published in academic medicine, and these are just a few of the titles, The Impact of Facilitation of Small Group Discussion of Psychosocial Topics in Medicine on Faculty Growth and Development, Perspective Acts of Interpretation, uh, sorry, Perspectives, Acts of Interpretation, a Philosophical Approach to Using Creative Arts in Medical Education, a Conceptual Framework for Using Illness Narratives in Medical Education, and Beyond Cultural Competence, Critical Consciousness, Social Justice, and Multicultural Education. Uh, the title of his talk today is Working Towards Justice in Medical Education, A Hedgehog's View. So thank you. Can, can everybody hear me, or do, you, do I need to stand next to a mic? Okay, I, I tend to project I, probably too much sometimes. Um, so I understand that this is the last session of the year, and, and I'm kind of hoping that your series of medical education grand rounds ends on a bang rather than a whimper. Um, so you know we're going to keep this informal, but I'm going to present some of the work that we're doing at Michigan, primarily geared around the issue of social justice and teaching for social justice. Um, First of all, I should say that I don't have enough imagination nor intelligence to be able to make any profit over, uh, out of what I do, so I have absolutely no conflicts of interest or industry relationships to declare. Um, so I wanted to start out the talk by talking about this one essay written by Isaiah Berlin uh, many years ago, and, and Berlin was an essayist, a philosopher, an Oxford don, and he wrote this little book called The Hedgehog and the Fox. The book is actually on Tolstoy's view of history, but he, he bases the book on this extant fragment by a pre-Socratic philosopher named Archilochus. And the fragment goes, as you can see, the fox knows many things and the hedgehog only one. So over the years, people have interpreted this to mean that the fox knows many lines of attack and the hedgehog only knows one line of defense, which is to roll up into a ball, to a spiky ball. Well, Berlin t took this you could say parable or just this fragment, and he said, let's apply it to thinkers. So there are some thinkers, in this case he talks about Tolstoy, who are the foxes. And these are, these are thinkers and writers who just revel in the richness, the, the details, the nitty gritty things of life. All right? And in contrast to that, you've got the hedgehogs, like Dostoevsky, who all of Dostoevsky's work can be summed up, can be boiled down to certain worldviews. Crime, redemption, evil, man's fate, man's will. So in that sense, all of Dostoevsky's work can boil down to a certain kind of certain ideas. Tolstoy is running all over the place. Richly, okay, richly, wonderfully, but he's all over the place. 
So we can do this, though. And, you know, and after reading this many, many years ago, you know, I'd sit around thinking about, well, who do I know who's a hedgehog and who's a fox? You know, and I mean, like, look at popular culture. You know, Bruce Springsteen, you guys do know who Bruce Springsteen is, right? Bruce Springsteen, Bruce Springsteen, hedgehog, right? Billy Joel, fox. Not, not in the way of fox, the, you know, but so you can do this, right? I mean, you know, Barack Obama, hedgehog, maybe. Mitt Romney, more fox, right? George Bush, who knows? So you can come up with these things, and we, you know, we, I do this with friends and stuff, but the point here, though, is that with this, with medical education, what I'd like us to do is actually really to get in touch with our inner hedgehog, okay? So to take a moment, step way back in terms of medical education and look at the world from a hedgehogian point of view. So what this means are asking the big questions. Big question number one, what is medicine? Well, that's way too big. So let's shrink it down to something that's a little bit more manageable. Big question number two, why should we engage in teaching and learning about medical ethics, the doctor-patient relationship, professionalism, diversity, disparities in medicine? Global health would also be included in this. So actually, I'd like you to take just a few moments, literally a minute or two, turn to the person next to you if you don't know each other, introduce yourselves if you don't like each other, put up with it, and, and a answer this question. Okay, just literally one minute. Please, go ahead. Okay, ideas. So why should we even start teaching about these areas? Would you like to hazard a guess? So you just say that's sort of the how, not the what of medicine? The how of medicine, that's really interesting. So could, what do you mean by that? So how, we do it. so how should we act in the world? So that implies a certain social context and a certain social value. That's interesting. Others? Yes? Um, this is my bias, <laughs> but I think it's necessary to do this because of the students that prepare for medical school and that are in medical school are immersed so fully in the particulars the essence of medical care and practice is lost. Mm. And this redeems that component of the education. So fascinating. So this is actually going along the same lines. I mean, it has to do really with the practice of medicine in society. I mean, essentially training hedgehogs it, it's a component in medicine. Of yeah. Preparation for care. Fascinating. For and giving care. Great. Others? Yes. Also, on the like, theme of process, I think it's uh, safe to assume that how we practice is how we practice. So if, as a medical student, I'm being trained just to like memorize facts and cram, um, and not being introduced to practicing how to listen and practicing how to reflect, then that's going to show when I'm actually with patients. Very interesting. So a lot of this revolves around practice and social practices and preparation and, and really kind of understanding underlying reasons, the mission of medicine in a sense. Um, so, you know, the one question is how, what else are we trying to create here? And I think you're, you're all going to the same themes in terms of why we would study any of these issues. So a, a proposal, and this is another way of kind of reframing it that's very, very similar to what you're talking about, is the task of medical education is to educate physicians to practice in a responsible, ethical, and just manner. All of these things deal with exactly what you're talking about, the details of practice and practice in society, practice in the context of human beings. But the question is then, how can this be done? How do we get there from here? 
So the obje objectives of this session is to compare the different ways of knowing and education of physicians, particularly in the areas of medicine that have social or societal significance. Because I believe that actually in medicine there are different ways of knowing things, and if we understand those ways, then we can adjust the way we teach and learn accordingly. Secondly, to critically assess the concept of competencies when applied to socially relevant areas of medicine. And thirdly, to, di to discuss the use of narratives, dialogues, reflective writing, creative art in teaching, and learning, and assessment in these areas. So how, how are we doing it now? Over the past 10 years, we've been on kind of a, an experiment in Michigan in which we've rolled out these certain kind of unique programs that are in part designed to address the kind of needs that you're talking about. How do you practice in a just, equitable, responsible manner in society? So uh, let me just show you that our efforts have really concentrated in the first two years, the M1 and the M2 years. And the, the basic plan is this. We have basic science sequences. Ours tend to be oriented, uh, organized around systems, so they're systems-based. Um, then we have these periods that are interspersed within this that are called clinical foundations of medicine. These are, these are uh, areas where the students don't have lectures, but they actually concentrate just on developing clinical skills, how to take a physical, or how to do a physical exam, how to take a history, um, issues involving clinical practice. And then there are two other small group-based courses, um, the family-centered experience and longitudinal cases that I've directed for the past 10 years. And this is really the areas where we spend a lot of time exploring these different issues of social relevance. So let me tell you first about the, the, the first program. This is the family-centered experience. This is a program where we take pairs of medical students during their first month of medical school, and we match them up with volunteers in the community who have a serious or chronic illness. It's a required course, so we have 170 students per class, two classes, that's 340 students, working with 170 families. The students that go to these families' homes for a series of visits, scheduled visits over two years, really for the sole purpose of listening to the stories that people tell about illness and its care. That's the only purpose. And the, the themes of these different visits involve things like the impact of illness on self and family, doctors and patients, stigmatization of illness, breaking bad news, lessons the families would like the students to really incorporate in their practice. It's a way of looking at illness and medical care from the patient's perspective. Well, what underlies all of this is the power of stories and storytelling. I think we could all say in all of our work and as people that, that over the years, okay, over the, the course of history, stories are actually mankind's way, humankind's way of really communicating the meaning of experiences from one person to another. We tell each other stories to pass on knowledge, but we also tell each other stories to understand ourselves and the world. So if you think about our favorite novel, our favorite short story, movie, uh, song, play, um, passage from the Bible or from the Torah or the Quran, all of these are stories that give life meaning and particularly give really difficult times in life meaning. So we use the power of these stories to really change perspective. So then the question becomes, what knowledge is gained? What are they actually learning in talking with these families? So we did some studies looking at this early on, and one of the studies I wanted to focus in on was this called one called Diabetes Stories. Um, I'm an endocrinologist by training. I specialize in diabetes. And it just so happened that Elizabeth Murphy, who is a resident um, whose younger brother had type 1 diabetes, was really interested in narratives. She came up to me, and we sat down, and we developed this project where we, looked, where we interviewed, or she interviewed, the medical students who had had volunteers with diabetes to get an idea of what they were learning and how they were learning from the stories that they heard. So there were several different themes that arose out of this. This is qualitative analysis. We used grounded theory methods. Um, there are several th themes, and I just wanted to highlight um, a couple of them. One was that stories themselves had emotional power. So the tone of the story and what they were learning was very different. Um, one student said, I think you can read about the disease and understand the cause of the disease, but you don't really get the feel, full effect about finding out about it from the beginning when you go to the hospital and figure out why you're feeling the way you are and the shock of what to expect. 
at home when they talked about when she first found out she had diabetes and how she sat in bed and cried, you can't get that from a book. You can't get the full effect of what that's like. This is very human knowledge that's passed from one person to another, told in very human terms, not in statistics, not in prognosis, but in terms of loss, frustration, pain, and they were really learning these lessons. So we found that the one thing that they also commented on was that these stories that they were hearing contained a different type of knowledge than what they said was this statistical, scientific, or general knowledge that provided in lectures. And ironically, I give the lectures in diabetes. And they said that this knowledge instead was very individual. It was contextual. Okay, it was rooted in the context of a specific family, a specific individual at a specific time. It was emotional and it was above all very human. So this is a very different type of knowledge. So it started me thinking that maybe what we were actually teaching, what the volunteers were teaching, and what they were learning was very, very different than the type of knowledge that they had learned in other ways. So I, I started thinking about this along the lines of the types of knowledge that we learn in medical education, okay, that we teach and learn. So to give you an example, the type of knowledge that you would need to interpret an EKG is very different than the type of knowledge you'd need to put together signs and symptoms of acromegaly and, and test signs, okay, and test results to, to use consensus statements to be able to diagnose this disease of growth hormone excess. But these two types of knowledge are very different than the type of knowledge you would need to comfort a woman, a mother, whose child is dying. Or the type of knowledge you would need to channel the rage you may feel from the fact that five million children under the age of five die every year from diarrheal disease in developing countries. Huge number, something we don't even think about. But how do you channel the rage you may feel, the moral outrage of that into an effective cure? These are different types of knowledge, okay? So, so in thinking about this, I ended up turning to the work of Jürgen Habermas, who's a German philosopher, um, uh, critical, of critical theory, started out uh, in, in the 40s and 50s and is, is still alive and still writing today. Um, anyway, in an early work by Habermas um, called uh, Knowledge and Human Interest, Habermas, taking actually Arist an Aristotelian uh, epistemologic approach, says that knowledge actually is not created in a vacuum, okay? That we don't learn things just to learn them. We learn them because we're driven by specific interests. And different types of knowledge the acquisition of different types of knowledge are driven by different types of interest. So to give an example, technical knowledge, which is the first one, is driven by what he calls instrumental interest. Okay? And the goal of technical knowledge is technical control over natural processes. To give you an example, we may study diabetes, the pathophysiology of type 1 diabetes. By understanding what the natural course of the disease is, we can intervene in that particular disease. So, in biomedical education, the obvious example of this type of knowledge is the vast amount of biomedical science that people learn. All right? How is this knowledge, how is the validity of this knowledge tested? It's tested through experimentation, either basic science or clinical experimentation. So it's, it's tested via classical experimental techniques. Practical knowledge, which is driven by communicative interests, on the other hand, is knowledge that is aimed at orienting action within traditions or consensus, okay? The way we diagnose diabetes is based on a consensus statement by the American Diabetes Association. How do we, so what are the, uh, what's the example of medical education? Standards of practice, either clinical practice, like the diagnosis of diabetes, or educational practice. How do we know that the students are fulfilling the things they need to fulfill in order to become physicians, all right? This is the so-called competency model fits along this second branch. The third one, which I found the most intriguing in some ways, is this critical knowledge, which is driven by what he calls emancipatory interests. And it is a reflective knowledge that is meant to serve human needs, okay? In this, there are a bunch of different types of fields of education professionalism, multiculturalism, medical ethics, global health, doctor-patient relationships, the list goes on. But there are a lot of areas of medical education that don't fit within the first two categories. Now that also means that this is not meant to be 
mutually exclusive. I mean, obviously, for people to develop a consensus statement in terms of, say, treatment of ischemic heart disease, you have to have knowledge of the biomedical sciences and the clinical sciences in order to be able to develop a consensus statement. On the other hand, um, if you, for instance, are working in medical ethics, you have to understand, say, end-of-life issues uh, from a pathophysiologic point of view in order to make any meaningful intervention. So the t these aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, but what I'm saying is that the emphasis in each is different. So if we talk about just critical knowledge, this other arm, okay, as I said, reflective knowledge to meet human needs, but what does that mean? I would argue, and, and Habermas alludes to this in terms of knowledge in general, is that this is the type of knowledge that we use as social beings to treat other human beings in society, okay? Professionalism, medical ethics, end of life issues, multicultural issues, global health, disparities, all of these deal with hum the human practice, but the societal practice of medicine, as you've mentioned. So these are all areas of social and societal significance. So what is the object, though? What do the students actually learn? Is it facts? Do they learn the facts of these things? It's not meant to be facts. And what I would argue instead is that in these areas, the goal of education in areas of social relevance in medicine is the development of a critical consciousness of self, others, and the world. It's a way of looking at the world, looking at oneself and others that makes a difference. So how is that different than the critical thinking that we teach students or that we propose teaching students? So critical thinking is cognitive. It's, a, it's analytical. It's evaluative. It's synthetic. In other words, we're synthesizing things together. And it's driven by objective or so-called objective interpretation of evidence and application of problems. This is the classic Cartesian thinking, OK? Philosophically, some people call it monological. What that means is that you can actually sit in a room by yourself and do this kind of thinking and arrive at conclusions, brilliant conclusions, like Hart and Descartes did, but it's, it can be a solitary activity, all right? On the other hand, the problem with this is that when it comes to societal problems, if one divorces one's thinking from societal needs, one ends up very much like this ostrich with its head in the sand, and this is how this is what medicine has been accused of over the years. So in contrast to that is critical consciousness. This is a concept that was developed by Paulo Ferreira, who is a Brazilian educator back in the 50s and 60s. And Ferreira was really interesting. He used to go out and was involved in literacy movements in Brazil. And he developed this idea that critical consciousness was essentially a recognition of individuals as conscious, reflective social beings an awareness of social contradictions and injustice, and a commitment to act to overcome injustice and oppression. So it ties people into society, and it ties the aims of education to serving the call of justice. So I would argue that in addition to the acquisition of knowledge, okay, through instrumental interests and clinical skills, and the development of empathy and collaboration, all of these things also come with the development of critical thinking and critical consciousness. And it is through this effort that we end up getting people who can practice medicine in a just, equitable, responsible manner. So we started talking about what the aim of this is and what the object of knowledge is. But you know, teaching this, you, there are you know, a lot of ways, there are a lot of different ways of approaching something like this. A lot of it in, is involved, uh, involves a lot of hand waving and things like that. For me, I was really interested, well, what are, the, you know, what are the theories that can drive something like this, and how is this different than how we're teaching now? So there are several conceptual approaches, and one of them is that new approaches sometimes mean toppling old paradigms in situations like this. So for instance, the, the traditional paradigm of the medical school faculty as being up here and the student being down here actually gets turned on its head, right? So traditionally, it's the medical student knows nothing. The faculty knows everything. This is what Ferrero would call the banking model of education. This is um, from work in 1973. 
So Ferrero maintained that in this, this model, this is the traditional model of education, that the teacher possessed all the knowledge very much like all the money, and would deposit this knowledge in the empty heads of students, very much like money in a bank. Okay? The students were passive recipients, they had no knowledge of this, they had no agency, they just received it. Okay? My own version of this is what I call the trough model of medical education, where you know, students come, regardless of what their background is, educators throw a bunch of knowledge into a trough and the students consume it. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an activity of, of consumerism, right? And really the only thing moving between their ears is their jaw. They're just constantly kind of absorbing this stuff without any critical reflection. So in contrast to this banking model, Ferrer uh, proposed what he called the problem-solving education. And he said this is essentially has different components. One of them is learning as a critically reflective act, that, that the student as one goes through is constantly thinking about one's own self, one's values, one's perspectives, and turning that critical regard out in the world. It is also learning as an active risk-taking activity and questioning activity, okay? Not only for the students, but for the teachers. We put ourselves out there in a risky way if we don't know the answers. So the type of teaching that goes on here, it's interesting, a, f a colleague of mine said this who's a teacher in my program, she said, you know, the, the interesting thing that we're trying to do is that this is not the Socratic method. And I asked her what she meant. She goes, well, in the Socratic method, the teacher knows the answers. In the kind of questions you're asking, nobody knows the answers, and you're trying to find them together. And I thought that was a really interesting comment. Also, learning is collaboration. The teacher, uh, the student is teacher, the teacher is student. I mean, I'm sure that Mount Sinai is very much like Michigan. I mean, you're a top school. You attract the best and the brightest, but people from all kinds of different backgrounds. Peace Corps volunteers, teachers, attorneys, nurses, uh, you know, People have done all kinds of different things. Traditionally, what we do is we take these people, we throw them in a lecture hall, we turn out the lights and PowerPoint them to death. All right? What we're trying to do with this new model is say, look, these people are coming with resources, lived experience, and we need to value that lived experience and put it into an engaged dialogue within small groups so that everybody learns, including the teachers. So one of the papers we published was the impact of these discussions on the faculty who actually teach in these groups. So environment. I just mentioned this, small groups. So the students and the faculty bring in their cells, what Robert Keegan would call the cultural surround in these engaged exchanges. These aren't meant to be abstract. They're meant to engage everybody and their entire cells in these conversations. Part of the reason why is because of my own belief that personal reflection and dialogue are the whetstone against which critical consciousness is sharpened. We reflect on things by, through dialogue. We reflect on things by approaching thorny issues in sincere and authentic discussions. So this very much is dialogical learning, unlike the monological activities that the thinker in a room thinks about. Another really important concept, and this actually came about through one of the early studies I started thinking more and more about, was this idea of what's, what Piaget calls cognitive disequilibrium. So, you know, Piaget, right, he was, the, he was a developmental psychologist, and he believes that as children developed cognitively, each, before they would advance cognitively to a new, more complex level, that period would be preceded by a period of what he called disequilibrium, a period of disquiet, where the child ran across unfamiliar things and identities and experiences and had to incorporate that into his worldview. Well, see, this happens with adults. If you think about it, think of a life-changing event that changed the, your perspective of how you see yourself in the world. And that period involved a period of intense disquiet and discomfort. And it forced you to think back on who you were, on your resources, on your strengths, in order to get through that period. Okay, so this is cognitive disequilibrium. Encounters with the unfamiliar prompt self-reflection and the opening of perspectives. This isn't just Piaget. I mean, here's a whole list of people. This is only a partial list. Dewey, the, Dewey has a notion called branch points, which is almost identical. Frere calls it reading the world. Don Schoen calls it reflection and action. Habermas has something called hypothesizing attitudes. Danlos encounters with otherness. Mesereau's disorienting dilemmas. These are all have in common this sense of disquiet that precedes an opening of perspectives. So we do this educationally. 
This is actually a deliberate in, intent to approach this particular activity. So to give an example, this other course that I read, the longitudinal cases, we, we use this specific technique. So these cases, I've shown you this before. This is the M1 and the M2 year, basic science sequences, clinical foundation of medicine. Here's the family center experience that we talked about. And then these longitudinal case studies. These are case studies that we, um, we launch in, in conjunction with the sequences. And they actually examine different clinical issues. Okay, to give you an example, this was a, 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 a longitudinal case on infertility, uh, the case of Jana and Rashid Chatila, who are a, a fictional couple, um, who are Muslim. This was done actually at the request and in collaboration with the Muslim Student Association. So what we do with these cases is we introduce the case um, and then give the students an opportunity to look at the case from a variety of different perspectives. So it's not just basic science. Um, and it's not just clinical, but also psychosocial, cultural, ethical perspectives. So we use these small groups and the cases as they prepare these cases to have the students engage in these kind of discussions, okay? So to give you an example of this sense of how do you create this cognitive disequilibrium, one of the uh, dilemmas that we posed in this particular case was that Janice Shatila has been reluctant to see a male physician for her gynecologic exams. This is the woman who is, she and her husband have issues of infertility, okay? Um, this has resulted in her avoiding a physician altogether for what might be problems related to infertility. We don't say that this is because of culture. This was what we said, all right? So we posed two questions. The first question is, should you as a healthcare provider facilitate her finding a doctor according to her preference. In other words, if you have a patient who requests a doctor of a specific gender, specific ethnic background, religion, race, should you be in a position to facilitate that patient's choice? Okay, that's one question, all right? Now this isn't just a question of personal preference because if you actually look at the uh, literature and healthcare disparities, if there is concordance between a patient and his or her health care provider, particularly in the case of African American patients. Clinical outcomes are better, patient satisfaction is better, and, and a variety of different measures are actually improved. Um, clinical outcomes is not just whether somebody's A1C is a little bit better. Sometimes it's a life or death case, and I think some of us are familiar with with the study that was done many years ago in the New England Journal where they looked at this in terms of cardiac intervention. So this could be life or death, all right? So that's the first question. But the second question is, what if a patient refuses to see a physician due to prejudice? Should his or her wishes be honored? The example that we give in this specific case is that say you are the, you are the attending physician, the senior physician on a medical team, and you have two students and you send one student to a room to see a new patient, the student comes back out and says, that patient does not want to see me because I am blank. I'm a woman, I'm of color, I wear a hijab, I wear a yarmulke, whatever. Should you, as the attending physician, say, okay, we'll send the other student in? So what would people say, would you? What would you do in a situation like that? Silence. Mm -hmm. What if, um, right, but what if, for instance, that the student who was sent in, it, to give you an example, when, it, when I trained in Los Angeles, um, the Vietnam War was well over, but there were a lot of Vietnam vets, and I would go into a room and subsequently get kicked out because they said, you know, I don't want to see a gook. So as my attending physician, would my attending physician then turn to somebody else who's non-Asian and say, okay, well, we'll send him in. Is that a good thing? Yes. No, it's not, it's not a good thing. Why not? Um, it, it, may be something that, it may be something that as the attending you can't actually change, but it's a terrible lesson for the students to learn is acceptable in clinical practice. So you may end up having to accept that this is the way it's going to be, but probably the right thing to do is to 
is to find a way to go into the room and have a discussion with the patient, even if it's a very brief discussion and you get kicked out. Yeah. Either alone first or with the students, and just address what the concern is and hear out what the patient has to say. And maybe if you're lucky, find an inroad where it's actually okay in the end for that person to go in or walk out with a better understanding of, of what that what what concerns that patient has, but also help the patient understand that that's just not acceptable behavior in this society. It's just not the way that we do things, even though in the end they're the patient and they get to see who they want to see, but it's just not right. So I think it's important to send a message in both directions. Yes, good, good. Yes, another comment. Yeah, I would agree with that, but I think at the end of the day, as a clinician, not always our job to correct the prejudices of a patient, but at the end of the day, we have to make sure that the patient is cared for. I mean, I think we yeah. often But on the other hand... Very challenging. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't that, though, in a sense, if the patient is expressing a specific bias, a specific prejudice, by, I mean, if you go in the room and you are an attending physician representing Mount Sinai, okay, then by your accepting that and acting on that, aren't you essentially taking that prejudice from an individual level to a systemic level? Yeah. Great. Okay. So what? Yes. One more of them. Uh huh. Right. And everybody on the team has to take care of that patient. Now, if you're in a private office and the patient walks into your office and sees you and turns around and walks out, fine. Yeah, you're right. It, it, you're right. The context does matter. But so the point here, if we could take a step back, and, and we could see how this could potentially, this, this is actually kind of paradoxical, right? Because in many ways, some people would facilitate the choice of one, but, but even if they don't facilitate the choice of the other, they would ne nevertheless, it would be troubling. This is exactly the type of paradox that we set up because it forces us to think about what's the difference between preference and prejudice? What is the role of the physician? You know, is it my job to necessarily act as a moral policeman for the patients that I care for? So how does all of this fit in? But it forces us to reflect in a broad way about many of the things that we don't even think about usually. We act unconsciously. So part of the role of the faculty, and the faculty play a huge role in this area, and um, that's why faculty development is really important, is to kind of shake things up and see what falls out. In other words, to illustrate these these contradictions, these dilemmas, and encourage an engagement towards solutions. You may not come up with a solution. We could talk about this particular issue for the next hour and a half, as we do in our small groups, and not necessarily come up with a consensus. But we've at least explored this from critical angles. All right? How do you, uh, your, your text is the pedagogy of oppression, as I recall. Yeah, the Ferrer's work. How do you influence the kind of questions you're asking? Expecting. That's a great point. And the, the point, I guess what I would like to say is that in this sense, I'm using the technique without necessarily insisting that the result be the same as the way I look at the world. Okay. So, so to give you an example, I mean, to say, look, we're going to talk about, say, uh, issues of race, all right? People may feel differently about affirmative action. They may feel differently about a variety of different issues. I have my own passionate commitments in this area. But nevertheless, the point isn't for me to absolutely convince you that my, my opinions are right, but it's for me and for everybody else to critically reflect. But nevertheless, there still is an overall mandate that we must practice medicine with justice. And I think, so it's not, um, it's not just that we say that, you know, we're going to have this free-for-all discussion and any opinion, as long as it's voiced, is valid. But on the other hand, we're not saying that this is the worldview we take and we insist that you adopt it as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it does, so yeah. it does leave it... it the role is still to fulfill need rather than to correct 
system in justice. Yes, but then oftentimes fulfilling need right. means Sorry, correcting injustice. Yeah. 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 No, 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 that's that's fine. That's fine. Yes. Um, it sounds it sounds more aspirational. Practicing medicine with justice. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm paraphrasing what you yeah. said. But I don't know if everyone agrees with that. I don't know if people agree with that across political parties or across regions of this country. You're right. Or pra private practice versus, you know, free clinic. Um, so I guess it's along the same lines of what Dr. Case is raising. You're, in this room, you may be preaching to the converted, so to speak. But in lots of other settings, they may look at you and say, what oppressed? Are they insured or are they not insured? <laughs> <laughs> You're right. But then the fact that we can engage people in these kind of discussions, I think that really matters, right? Yeah. Okay. So... How, do you, how, does this, how does this kind of critical exploration of our one's biases and one's assumptions, can, how can narratives play a role in this? And I'd like to talk about going back to this family-centered experience, a specific area of stigma and illness. So we talk about stigma, and this is one of the visits. We have the, the, vol, the students go talk with the volunteers about their experiences with stigma. And we talk about it and encourage them to think about it, talk about it in terms of differences in power. Okay, so to give you an example, if a medical student tells another medical student he's a jerk and he's stupid, that's a very different feeling than if an attending tells the same medical student he's a jerk and he's stupid. Okay, stigma is defined by power, and, and to be able to understand that in the context of, of medicine and the practice of medicine, I think becomes critical. So this is one of the, student, the things the students explore. Another thing is the idea of uh, interplay of multiple stigmatized identities based on physical ability, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and class. So how all of these things come together when talking about problems with stigmatization that people encounter who have chronic illness. We also give them a reading, and I think part of this, in terms of getting people to engage in really thinking about these issues, is doing something, having something that actually means something personally to them, okay? that has significance, that, so it's not an abstract argument. So we actually use reading that, as I put it, cuts very close to the bone by actually asking them to read this, this um, publication by Tom Schwank, who is the former chair of family medicine at Michigan. Well, he, wrote a, he, he and colleagues wrote a paper uh, several years ago in which they looked at depression, stigma, and suicidal ideation in medical students, our medical students, University of Michigan medical students. And we have other medical students, not in the same cohort, but other medical students read about this. And what's really interesting is that, you know, the prevalence of depression, suicidal ideation is, is as high at Michigan as it is nationally. Okay, so we don't have any, you know, we don't, we're not leaders in the best in this area, fortunately. But nevertheless, there clearly are areas of stigmatization where people will say, I will not tell anybody that I have depression because I'm afraid that that may get to the medical school or an attending may feel differently about me. So we have them engage in this conversation, well, what would you do in a situation like that? And obviously there are people in the class who talk about this who, are, who do suffer from depression. So it's another way of engaging people in these conversations. When we talk about narratives, storytelling, there are risks involved in addition to the trauma that people may feel when they're re recounting these. One of them, this is by Megan Bowler, she talks about this idea of spectating bearing or bearing witness. This is the idea that you can tell a story that can be very moving, but people can leave without being changed. An example is, say, driving down the freeway and seeing a horrible accident, seeing all the ambulances, the blood, and all that, and driving along thinking, oh, that's terrible, that's horrible, that's tragic. I wonder what's for dinner. So we can leave, we can go through the accident, and really go on with our daily lives without it impacting us in any way. So she calls that spectating. In contrast is this notion of bearing witness where you actually witness someone else's struggles and you say to yourself, I will, I will take responsibility if not for the cause, for its solution. So it actually prompts people to action rather than just saying this is a sad event I'll go on with my life. And I think this is, so when we talk about narratives, it's not just the stories we tell, but it's how we tell them, how it gets people to prompt towards action. If people are saying, I was treated badly when I was in the hospital uh, giving birth to my, my first child, 
If a medical student hears that and hears these stories, hopefully the medical student will say, well, gee, those things that happened according to that patient just didn't seem right, and as a physician, I will change. I will not do the same thing. Bowler says, quotes a, a, someone uh, in her book by saying, these others whose lives we imagine don't want empathy, they want justice. So this is getting back to the whole idea of justice. Okay, so critical learning, learning to read the world. How does this model fit with current standards of competency? Okay, you hear this word all the time. This is the buzzword in medical education these days. So I would maintain that there are different aspects of learning and we can look at competencies versus critical learning in terms of these aspects and know the differences between them. So the emphasis in competencies, it's all on outcomes. Okay, the process of how to get there doesn't matter. It's, it's what is there that counts. Critical learning, the process itself is the most important. Okay, the emphasis is very different. Product, in competencies, it's an observable outcome, something that you can see, something that you can test, something that you can evaluate through a standardized setting. In critical learning, it tends to be more tacit. It's indwelling. This tacit word comes from Polanyi's idea that the knowledge that we acquire through life oftentimes resides deep in us. It, it dwells within us. Um, and it's, it, it le resides largely on an unconscious level. So it becomes very difficult to grasp. You can't do this through multiple choice exam, for instance. Application, competencies emphasize standardization. Critical learning is much more individual and unique. Competencies develop knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And all activities are broken down in this. On the other hand, critical learning develops understanding. I don't mean just a cognitive appreciation of things, but understanding meaning a deep and personal abiding engagement in the subject of one's inquiry, be it research, be it addressing issues of poverty, addresses of global health, end of life. It's a, it's a, it's a personal, supra-cognitive activity. Progress in the competency model, it's filled through a checklist, okay, knowledge, skills, attitude, check. In understanding, understanding is never ending. It's always, you can always add to understanding. It's open to new thoughts, new ideas. And finally, agency, and this is what we were talking about, Eric. So competencies, the thing about competency model is that it is something that is designed by people who are considered experts, by authorities, and then imposed on students. Okay, here are the competencies you need to meet in order to graduate from medical school. And they can be, and, and not, no, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that these are all bad. I mean, I teach endocrinology and I think competencies for endocrinology are great. You need to know what that insulin makes the blood sugar go down. You need to know that type controlled diabetes reduces complications. But in terms of these other areas, I would suggest that it doesn't fit. And, and what it does is you take these ideas and you impose them on students and don't allow the students to be active agents of their own future and their own learning. So assessing medical education becomes actually a real challenge. How do you assess these areas? And it just reminds me of this joke that actually Robert Keegan likes to tell. So late one night this traveler's going down the road and he comes across an old man underneath a street lamp. This old man's looking on the ground furiously and the traveler turns to the old man and goes, what are you looking for? And he goes, I lost my wallet. So the traveler gets down on the ground, they're both looking around, and finally the traveler looks at the old man and says, how do you know your wallet's here? And the old man goes, I have no idea it's here, the light's better here. Okay, so what we often do when we're trying to assess professionalism and competencies is we go to what's simple. We go to the, the modules that we can easily quantify and put in some person's transcript rather than the more difficult issues. So what are the more difficult issues? Consider, consider things like longitudinal observations, reflective essays and journals, and dialogues about portfolios. So having students accumulate the work involving reflection and presenting it as a subject of ongoing dialogue with a faculty instructor. Another way is through art. And since the time is short, I'm gonna go through this very quickly. But basically, we actually in, oops, sorry. I wanna go backwards, one second. So in the family-centered experience, we have them do an interpretive project. So they get together and they talk about their family's experiences, and then they express their understanding through an artistic project. 
Okay, now you figure that med students think this is like 15 on the weird scale, and they do. We get a lot of pushback, but the kind of work that we see out of these projects is phenomenal. So to give you an example, this is one. Art can be used as critique. Art can be used as a way of developing critical reflection. In this case, this is called The Face of Illness by Lee Karuli Nayak Young. They take a portrait of a woman and divide it up into fragments and posted these fragments on a board. So if you look at these fragments, they all look bizarre. And what the students were saying was, you know, that there's a shattering of identity with illness, that there are ways, there's physical signs that are regarded as repulsive, as stigma, by people who don't know that person. So there are physical signs of illness. Um, but there are also a critique of the medical uh, system by saying that what we're doing is we're reducing individuals down to fragments into a series of diagnoses that we put down on paper. We're not looking at them as holistic. So what they did was with this particular sculpture, if you look at it in any one of these directions, you have these bizarre fragments. If you look at it on FAS, the portrait reemerges. A different portrait, but nevertheless one that's whole. We've been very successful in having a lot of this work published in academic medicine over the past four years. So finally, you know, so I was talking to a friend of mine, Rob Lash, and we were talking about this whole idea of critical pedagogy. And, and he, he made a remark that, um, and he's kind of a wit, and he said, um, Arno, you know the problem with your critical pedagogy is that it's so damn critical. And what he meant by that was he said, look, you know, you spend so much time looking at, you know, injustice and, and issues of disparities and all of these things, and it's so negative. Where's the positive? And it was really interesting he said that because he, you know, it reminded me of this line from Nietzsche, philosophizing with a hammer, is that, yes, we are looking at these things, but one of the things that actually has, has um, motivated me was this statement by Adorno that I read many, many years ago. The premier demand on education is that Auschwitz never happen again. So Adorno believed that Auschwitz basically invalidated the value of philosophy and of much of what man does. Okay? Because of this sheer horror, of this sheer evil of this act, it turned philosophy from this grand idea of what life and morals were to nothing but superfluous words. So he said that education was in order to address things so that evil isn't perpetuated. And for me, that became very much of a negative call, right? My version of that was the premier demand on all medical education is that Tuskegee never happen again. But looking at it, though, this is really negative. And I guess what I would say, and this is perhaps going back to the issue of justice, is that ultimately, as, as Martin Luther King said, the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends towards justice. If we look at all of these different areas of social practice of medicine, a lot of them deal with the fact that you want to train somebody so that when my mother goes into their office, she's going to be treated as well as anybody else is treated. That's actually an issue of fairness and justice. And that actually is very positive. So ultimately, going back to Ferreira, who likes to look at teaching as an act of liberation, Ferreira says that teaching is the practice of freedom, that in part that we teach each other in order to address human needs and in order to free mankind from suffering. So in that sense, that's the ultimate thrust of this. And yes, it is, sounds a little bullshy, I realize that, but, you know, but I think that this is an important value in medical education. So um, a word from our sponsors. Thank you for attending Medical Grand Rounds. Please be sure to fill out the CME evaluations. And I'd just like to acknowledge the volunteers and students and faculty of my course, my assistant directors over the years, and Joe Fantone and Casey White, who developed this project originally. Thank you very much.